I have a friend whose family will often talk about the present of being present. And I love that phrase, and I love it every time I hear them talking about it, because as a task-oriented person, I can get very caught up in all the things I need to do. I love to cross things off of my to-do list. I want to get that thing done. I want to go to where I need to go. I even will put things on my to-do list after they're done in order to have the satisfaction of crossing them off. And that type of personality sometimes forgets that there is a great blessing and a great gift in just being with people. That sometimes the best thing we could do is not anything at all, but to simply walk alongside someone as they celebrate the good things or as they overcome the difficult things that God has put in their lives. And if that's true of merely a human's present, how much more true is it that the God of the universe is present with us? If it is a blessing for us to have another human walk alongside of us, how amazing it is that the God who created the heavens of the earth, who has every molecule of our body under his control, who spoke into existence the earth and the stars and each and every one of us, who designed us intently and intricately, that God of the universe walks alongside his kids. What amazing blessing and amazing privilege that is. And as we look today in our passage, we are going to see that God was present with the nation of Israel. He had called them out and he had said, I will be with you. And they recognized that that was an honor that that was something that they should esteem and prize. And if they should do it, how much more should each of us? Because whether you're a new Christian or you've been a Christian for ages, God has said, I will be with you. And that should give us great comfort, and that should give us great confidence, and that should give us great courage and great strength. So let us look today at what it meant for the Israelites to have God dwell among them. And let us see how it can provide us a deeper understanding of what it means that God is with us and that we can enjoy his presence. So if you haven't already, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 25. And if you're a leader and you're looking at your outline and you're thinking, oh, wow, she has all three chapters on this outline, I promise you, as far as it is up to me, you will get to your discussion questions. I am not going to keep you here until next week. We are going to take a 30,000 foot view of these three chapters. So leaders, do not panic. I will leave you time. As my mom would say, if Lord willing and the creek don't rise, you will get to your discussion groups and you will tackle those discussions questions. But turn with me to Exodus 25 and we're going to dig into our passage. As you look at Exodus 25, probably the first thing that you saw was that there are a lot of specific details and requirements. God is going to give the Israelites very specific instructions about what materials they need to use, what things they need to construct, how those things should be constructed in order to build this most holy place. He has very specific plans in mind. And they were clearly ordained by God. He gave them to Moses in order for Moses to give them to the craftsman so that this edifice could be constructed exactly as God desired. And because we know these were ordained by God, the Israelites could take great confidence that they were going to build exactly what God wanted. So similarly, you and I can, point one, be confident in God's detailed plans. We can be confident in God's detailed plans. You leaders who didn't believe me, we're already at point one. (laughs) I'm just saying. All right? We can be confident in God's detailed plan. Again, let's look at the passage. Chapter 25, verse 1 says this. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the people of Israel, that they take for me a contribution from every man whose heart moves him you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is what you're going to receive from them. 
gold, silver, bronze, pearl, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen, goat's hair, tan ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil, spices for the oil and spices for the fragrance. You're going to receive onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and for the breast piece. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in your midst. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so shall you make it. The first thing that we see is that God has a lot of requirements of what the Israelites are to bring. But we also can see kind of underneath in this list of the requir this requirement, God's generosity in providing all these things to the Israelites. Remember, the Israelites were a refugee people. They had escaped slavery under the hand of Pharaoh for hundreds of years. And they go out into the desert, and as they go out into the desert, the Egyptians are giving them all of these things to usher them out the door. And then God takes all of those things that he's already provided through the hands of the Israelites' enemies. He says, all of those things that I've given you, now you're going to use all of that to build the tabernacle that I am going to design for you. See, God said, you're going to make a contribution to me, but it was something that God had already given to the Israelites. He had already provided all of that material that they were then going to give back to him for his purposes. We also see God's care that he gives detailed instructions on how those materials are going to be used. It says in verse 9, exactly as I show you, concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all its furniture, so shall you make it. See, God had detailed plans, and he was going to provide everything that the Israelites need to execute that plan. We see God's detailed plan in his care again later in the chapter, in verse 23, chapter 25, verse 23, he's going to talk to them about this table that he wants them to make. It says, you shall make a table of acacia wood. These shall be its measurements, two cubits length, a cubit its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold around it. And you shall make a rim around it a hand breadth wide and a molding of gold around the rim. And you shall make for it four rings of gold and fasten the rings to the four corners at its four legs. Close to the frame the ring shall lie as holders for the poles to carry the table. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and the table shall be carried with these. And you shall make its plates and dishes for incense, its flagons and bowls with which to pour drink offerings. You shall make them of pure gold, and you shall set the presence of the bread, sorry, the bread of the presence on the table before me regularly. See, God was reminding the Israelites, I'm going to provide all that you need all the material, all the things that you need to go about executing this plan, I'm going to give it to you. And he reminds us of us even in this section of that truth because bread was signified, signified God's provision for the Israelites. As I'm sure you remember, he provided bread, manna, to feed them in the desert. When they had no way of providing the food that they would eat, he gave it to them in the form of bread. But those 12 loaves that were set before him was also a reminder that the 12 tribes of Israel were under his care. Those 12 loaves of bread signified that I'm not only going to provide your earthly provisions in the desert, but every one of you Israelites, I'm going to continue to provide all the earthly provisions that you need. And when it comes to us being confident in God's detailed plans, we can also trust that he will give us all the earthly provisions that we need to do the work that he has called us to do. Now, for the Israelites, he gave, those, he gave very detailed instructions. His plans were very specific. And God doesn't always provide us the specific details of how he's going to provide our earthly provisions. But we know that he cares about providing our earthly provisions because Jesus himself said in Matthew 6, when he was teaching us how to pray, he said that we should pray, give us our daily bread. Give us exactly what we need from an earthly perspective in order to keep running the race that you have called us to run. Give us our daily bread. 
And later in that same chapter, Jesus says, and don't worry about what you will eat or what you will drink. Because if I take care of the birds of the sky and the lilies of the field, I am going to take care of you. I'm going to give you all that you need, all the earthly provisions to do the work that I've called you to do. I had a wonderful example of how we can trust in God's detailed plans this last week and a half. I know many of you know that our family has been dealing with a medical crisis over the last week and a half, and it's been a trying time. And unfortunately, God, or probably fortunately, God did not tell me in December when Stephanie asked me if I could teach, hey, by the way, while you're scheduled to teach, you're going to also be having to talk to doctors and nurses and run to and fro the hospital. You're going to have to be doing research. You're going to have all these things going on. Because quite frankly, if God had told me that, and then Stephanie had asked me to teach, I would have very kindly and very firmly said, no way. No way. I'm not going to take on teaching something when I know that there's all these things going on. But God had a plan. And even though I didn't know it at the time, he knew that this is exactly where I should be. Because see, normally on any given week, when it's a Tuesday and a Wednesday, I'm preparing three different lessons to teach to my classes. This week, I prepared one lesson to teach to you all. And you know what's easier than preaching, teaching three different lessons? Teaching one lesson three times. And God knew that instead of being in Riverside for huge portions of the day, that I needed to be in Orange County so that if I did need to run up to the hospital or if I did need to take phone calls, I wasn't stuck in class for hours at end, but I was readily available in order to have those conversations. And God knew that I needed to be surrounded by my sisters in Christ rather than surrounded by my very precious students who I love dearly, but they do not provide me the same love and support that you all do. And God knew that I needed to be studying a passage about all, all about God's detailed plans and how he will provide everything that we need. Because I'm telling you, when there's a medical mystery and the doctors who have been trained in various specialties can't figure out what's going on, you know what's a great comfort? That God has every molecule of our bodies under his control, that he cares about the details of our life, and that he will provide exactly what we need. We see another area in which we can trust in God's provision and his detailed plans. Earlier in our chapter, in verses 10 through 16, chapter 25, verses 10 through 16, starts talking about the Ark of the Covenant, this very sacred box that he is going to instruct the Israelites to make. And he says this, they shall make the ark, this box of acacia wood. It shall be two cubits and a half its length and a cubit and a half its breadth and a cubit and a half its height. I'm gonna give you the precise measurements. And this box, you're gonna overlay it with pure gold and you shall make a molding of gold around it. And because this box is so special, you're going to cast for it rings of gold. And through those rings, you're going to put poles that are covered with gold. And you're not even going to lift up this box. You're going to carry it with these poles overlaid with gold because it is such a precious and such a sacred thing. And verse 16, and you shall put in this ark of the, you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. You are going to put into this ark this covenant relationship that I've already intended in order to provide for you. As one commentator put it, the ark symbolized God's presence, his purity, his superiority, and his covenant blessing. And by these detailed plans for the ark of the covenant, we can see that God not only will provide all we need from an earthly perspective, perspective, but he'll provide all that we need spiritually as well. Because did you catch that in verse 16? I'm going to provide the testimony. I'm going to initiate the relationship with you. See, the Israelites needed to know that they had nothing to offer God. Their right relationship with him, the fact that God was going to dwell in their midst, had nothing to do with what they had earned or what they deserved. It was all an act of grace. 
and God had to initiate that relationship with them. We further are reminded of that in chapter 25, verse 17, where he talks about this mercy seat that is going to signify his dwelling place. Verse 17 says, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And on it there shall be two cherubims of gold, a cherubim on the one and a cherubim on the other end. And of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubims are going to spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat, you shall put this atonement cover on the top of the ark. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the, co- of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment to the people of Israel. See, this mercy seat, this atonement cover, this place where God would meet with them, reminded them that atonement was necessary in order for them to have a right relationship with the creator of the world. They could not initiate initiate that relationship themselves. It was something that God had to provide for them. And just like God will provide all that we need in our earthly provisions, God will provide all that we need for our eternal, eternal security as well. And we can trust that he is enacting his detailed plans to provide exactly that. And we can trust as Christians looking back and seeing what Christ accomplished on the cross that he has already provided in a detailed and specific way all that we need in order to have confidence in our eternal security. At the end of the chapter, we see further indication of why we can be confident in God's detailed plans. Look with me in the final verses of chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. And God's going to give them instructions about the lights that are going to light up this area. It says this, You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base, its stems, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers shall be of one piece. It's all going to be united. There's going to be this one thing. It's not going to be all these different pieces put together. We're going to have one piece, and I'm going to paint you a picture with this piece that you're going to make. And there shall be six branches going out of it, three on one side and three on the other side. And there are three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on one branch, and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on the other branch. So therefore, the six branches going out of the lampstand. Can you picture what God is instructing them to make here? This is a lampstand, sure. It's providing light, but it's also, its imagery is of that of a tree. It even uses words that we associate with plants, branches and flowers and blossoms, right? It's painting a picture for the Israelites. This light is going to have a practical purpose, but he wants the Israelites to see something deeper in it as well. On the lampstand itself, verse 34, there shall be four cups made like almond blossoms with their calyxes and flowers and a calyx of one piece with the under each branch of the six, each pair of the six branches going out from the lampstand. Their calyxes and their branches shall be of one piece with it. It's a whole united item, the whole of a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. And you're going to make seven lamps for it. And then you're going to make its utensils, its tongs and its trays, and all the utensils out of a talent of pure gold. And see that you make them after the pattern for them, which is being shown you on the mountain. As I mentioned, there's a very practical use for what God is instructing them to make. The priests are going to need light as they come in to the tabernacle. However, God is also painting for the Israelites a picture. He's reminding them that he is the source of light, just like he provided a pillar of fire to guide them out of uh, Egypt, and just like he called light out of the darkness at the moment of creation, But because that lampstand was shaped like a tree, God is reminding them that God is also the provider of life. As you'll recall in Genesis 2-9, in the middle of the Garden of Eden, 
there was placed in there the tree of life. See, God would provide light, and he provides life to all of his kids. And it's not just in the Garden of Eden and in the moment of creation that we're reminded of this interplay between light and life. In John 1, 4, speaking of Jesus, it says this about him. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. See, God has detailed plans for our earthly provisions. God has detailed plans for eternal security. And God has detailed plans to provide the light and the life that we need. And those detailed plans were ultimately fulfilled when the promised Messiah, his son, Jesus Christ, came to earth in order to atone for your and my sins. Well, God is not done providing some plans to the Israelites. And as we look at chapter 26, we're going to see some more detailed plans. And what Moses has done is he's related these plans by going out from where the inmost areas, right, the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the inmost area, and he's going to start moving outward to see, okay, well, what's, what's going to be the frame, what's going to be the edifice that is going to surround these most precious and these most holy things? And in verse 20, or chapter 26, he starts giving them the instructions for that. And as I'm sure you remember for the study, as he's talking about the tabernacle, we have to remember that the tabernacle, that word, means dwelling place. So in other words, God is giving to the Israelites the instructions for his house, for the place that he would dwell. And there's several components that he relates to as he gives them these construction plans. Verses 1 through 6, to have the construction plans for the tabernacle itself, the edifice that they are going to build. Verses 7 through 14, tell them how they're going to build the roof and the coverings. Verses 15 through 30, say this is how you're going to build the walls that are going to go around it. And verses 31 through 30, 37, talk about the inner screen, this inner veil, and the entrance. And as we look at all of these things, what we see is that there is a lot of detail and richness and elaborateness in the plans that God provides for his dwelling place. See, in verses 1 through 13, where it talks about the curtain, we see that there's going to be curtains of linen and curtains of goat hair. There's going to be inner curtains for beauty, and there's going to be outer curtains for protection. In verse 14, we see there's going to be another layer of protection, another layer to provide of skin that will help protect this tabernacle. In verses 15 through 30, he provides instructions for the frame, and he tells us in verse 29, this frame is going to be overlaid with gold because he wanted the Israelites, every time they looked at that tabernacle, to remember how precious and how holy God is. And then as he provides the instructions for the veil, he's reminding them that the most holy place is going to be separated. It's going to be set apart from all of the other spiritual activities, because that is the place that is most precious. That is the place where Moses would meet with God. And it's that same veil that in Matthew 27, 51, it says was ripped in two upon the death of Jesus. And yet we see there's another screen, another covering at the entrance to the tabernacle in verses 36 and 37. All of these descriptions should remind us of a couple different things. First, the fact that it was covered with gold should remind us of how holy God is and how worthy he is, how regal and majestic and how much honor and deference he deserves. But it's not only the gold that should remind us of this. All of those curtains, all of those layers, all of those coverings should remind us that God is set apart from us. See, God was going to dwell with the Israelites but he never wanted them to think, I'm just one of the guys. I'm just like you. He wanted to make it clear that he was distinct, that he was separate. His dwelling place was set apart as a visual reminder of what an honor it was for God to be in their midst. And similarly, you and I need to point to, appreciate the privilege of your father's presence. We need to appreciate the privilege of our father's presence. You see, God is holy. He is not like us. He is with us, 
but he is not one of us. And this promise that God is with us is repeated in both the Old and the New Testament. Deuteronomy 31.8, God reminds the Israelites, he will go before you, Yahweh will go before you. He will be with you, he will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And Hebrews 13.5 says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That promise of his presence is secure. But that promise of his presence should never make us forget that it is a privilege that he would walk alongside us, that it is a privilege that he is in our midst. We should be encouraged by the reality of God's presence with his people, but we should also be amazed by it. God owes us nothing. He owes us nothing. Least of all does he owe us himself. And yet he has said, I will be with my people. It would have been wrong for the Israelites to approach the tabernacle as if it was any other building. For them to look at that and think just like, oh, that's like the grocery store or the market or, you know, where I get my clothes. It would have been wrong for them to look at that building and think of it was of anything as less than special and to look at it with reverence and awe that God would be among them. And it is wrong for us to approach the throne room of God made possible through the blood of his son with anything less than reverence and gratitude and amazement. And while it was a privilege for the Israelites to have God in their midst, and they recognized what an honor it was that of all the nations, God would dwell with them, we should also recognize that our experience of God's presence is even richer than theirs was. Because Hebrews 10, 19, 19 through 22, reminds us that we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of our faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then the writer of Hebrews continues, Therefore, let us hold fast the confession of our faith, the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. See, not everyone could approach that most holy that most inmost dwelling place of God for the Israelites. Only the most high priest could go in there. And even in the tabernacle, only the priests could enter. But for you and I, because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, because of his death and his resurrection, we no longer need someone else to approach God on our behalf. We can come to God at any time, in any place, in any situation, with any difficulty, with any joys, with any sorrows, with any celebrations, we can come with confidence before the throne of God. Let us give thanks that our faithful Father is with us wherever he leads, that he is always among us, and that because of the blood of Jesus, we can boldly and confidently approach him at any, at any moment of our lives. Next, as we turn to chapter 27, we're going to start seeing what the Israelites would see as they were approaching the tabernacle. As they would be looking upon the tabernacle, we're going to see what would line their access way, what they're going to see as they would enter in to this holy place. The first thing that we see is the outside of the tabernacle is going to be an altar. In verses 1 through 8 of chapter 27, God tells Moses that that altar is going to be made of acacia wood. And that altar, on that altar, are going to be made sacrifices for the sins of the people of Israel. So as the Israelites would look upon the tabernacle, this place where God dwelled, they would be reminded of their sins and the atonement that would need to be made on their behalf. Then surrounding the tabernacle in the courtyard 
chapter, verses 9 through 19, describes what that courtyard is going to be like. And again, we see that there's going to be hangings that are going to surround and line the entrance way into this most holy place. And then in verses 20 through 27, we see instructions for the lamps that will burn all night, ultimately pointing the people to the light of the world, Jesus Christ, showing them that while this light eventually may burn out, there is going to be a permanent light that is coming and that you need to look forward to that light. In fact, all of these descriptions, we are reminded that for the Israelites, access to the place where God dwelled required passing through the courtyard and by the altar, but for us, approaching God confidently, we can approach God confidently because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Or as I put it in point three, we need to treasure the access provided by Christ. We need to treasure the access provided by Christ. All of these points along the entrance path, you have the outside coverings, you have the courtyard, you have the altar, reminded the Israelites that there was distinctions that God made among the people. If you were just an ordinary average Israelite, you could get no further than the courtyard. If you wanted to meet with God, that was the closest that you could get. If you were a priest, you could make sacrifices on the altar and you could go into the tabernacle. But it was only the high priest who once a year could go into the most holy place. There was distinction, there was separation. Their access was limited. But our access to God the Father, our access to the peace of his presence is ours in abundance because of the work that Christ did on our behalf. Everyone who is in Christ has direct access to God. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says this, Since then we have a great high priest. And as a reminder, the writer of Hebrews is writing to Jewish Christians. So all of this imagery, he's telling them, hey, this imagery that you had in the Old Testament, let us remember there was a purpose in that. And now we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Therefore, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then again draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. Because of Christ's most holy sacrifice, we don't have to worry about what our access to the Father is. We don't have to be concerned or have a mediator to come before God on our behalf. We can come to God anytime, at any place, confident that he will provide exactly what we need. As Romans 8.32 reminded us, if he did not spare his own son, if he was willing to send his most precious, his most beloved, his most holy son, in order to take on the penalty that Christ had not earned, to cover the punishment, to take on the punishment on our behalf, if he was willing to do that, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Because of what Christ accomplished, we can have confidence that when we approach our Father, that when we dwell in his presence, God is going to give us all that we need. He did not spare his own son. He gave his son up on our behalf. How much more will he graciously give us all things? Christ's sacrifice has provided us permanent access to the almighty God. Christ's sacrifice has given us permanent access to the creator of the heavens of the earth, the king of kings and lord of lords, the one who controls everything all the stars and the planets and the moons and every single aspect of our day. The one who has everything under his sovereign control, Christ has given us access, unfettered access to him. May we treasure this. May we take comfort in this. May we recognize what a privilege and an honor it is. It's easy to read through all of these lists and to have them go one, in one ear and out the other. 
We read through these list of materials. We read through these construction plans. And it's easy to think, oh, this doesn't pertain to me. I'm not going to build a tabernacle anytime soon. This has nothing to do with my life. But we need to remember, even for the Israelites, where these instruction plans had a very practical purpose, they were to build the building that God commanded. He instructed them to build that building, not for the building itself, because he was pointing forward to the future and promised Messiah. He wanted them to look at that building and remember that he is holy. He wanted them to look at that building and remember that they needed atonement, that they needed a covering for their sins. He wanted them to look at that building and remember that he has detailed plans and he would provide and take care of them. Just as he had called the nation of Israel out of all the other nations to be an example, that building was to be an example to the Israelites that one day there would be a permanent sacrifice, that one day there would not need to be a system of priests because the great high priest would come and take on the penalty of our sins. He wanted to remind them that God was working out his story of salvation. And they could be confident that just as he was faithful to provide all that they needed in the desert, he would continue to be faithful to provide all that they need for eternal security in him. Similarly, may we take confidence in the fulfillment of God's detailed plans in both our lives and in the salvation story. May we take comfort and privilege and take comfort and joy in the privilege of knowing that we have daily and regular and unfettered access to the God of the universe. May we take joy in the fact that because of the work of Jesus Christ, God is always with us, that he will never leave us or forsake us. And wherever we are, as he leads us, we can be confident that he is also walking alongside us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you all for this study. I thank you for the fact that there's such richness in these instructions that you provided to your people. Father, I thank you that you care about the details. That you care not only about the details of this tabernacle that would be built to signify your holiness, but you care about the detail of our lives as well. Father, help us to increasingly take joy in the fact that you are always with us, that you never leave us or forsake us, and Father, even as we take joy in that truth, help us to also remember that it is a privilege and an honor that you would walk alongside us. Father, be with these groups as they go into their discussion questions. I ask that it would be a rich time of encouragement. It would be a rich time of conviction. It'd be a rich time of motivation and of comfort and joy as we recognize what a privilege it is that you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.